What a not coincidence, but providential. I want you to turn back to Romans chapter 13, verse 11. <clears throat> Romans chapter 13, verse 11, on scripture reading. And it says, and do this, knowing the time. Paul wants us to know the time that we live in. Not to be ignorant. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. If you tell them to awake out of sleep, it implies that we are asleep. She's telling us, time to wake up. Wake up out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I ask you now that you take these words and that this message may fit every single one of us and convict our hearts through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. If you turn with me now to Matthew chapter 25. Now don't miss that Romans chapter 13 verse 11. It is time to wake up out of sleep. Put that sleep word in, on the shelf in your mind somewhere. Paul is telling us to wake us. Paul is saying, time to wake from sleep. Matthew chapter 25 is a parable that we are all familiar with. It's a parable of the ten what? The ten virgins. Right. And it's, it's a parable that Jesus gave to tell us, to teach us about what? about to be ready about the second coming of Jesus. Because if we, if we look at a little context, chapter 24 are the signs of the time. Chapter 23, Jesus is saddened. At the end of chapter, uh, uh, chapter 23, Jesus is saddened because Israel and Jerusalem didn't accept Him as Messiah. And He, and, and he is saddened he says in verse 37 of chapter 23, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who killed the prophet and stones those who said to her. So he, he is sad because he poured his ministry, his heart, and they rejected him. And in verse 24, Jesus gives the sign because his disciples asked the signs. He tells his disciples, you see this, this beautiful temple? It's going to be destroyed. Nothing is going to be left. And the disciples are taken back. Well, when is this going to happen? Tell us. And chapter 24 is a chapter of the, signs of, of the signs of the end of times. And if you turn to verse 36. 24 verse 36. Jesus says there, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then he compares it as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be when the coming of the Son of Man comes. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the day before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Here Jesus is saying it's going to be regular life. Eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Anybody ate and drank this morning? I did. It's just, Jesus is saying life is going to go on as usual. Until the day, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And did not know the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. If you jump to verse 42, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for, the time, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also, and this is where we get our title, be what? Ready. Ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour which you do not expect. Jesus is telling his disciples, and are, are we his disciples? Yes. So he's talking to us. Be ready, because you do not know 
when I am going to return. You, it's going to be when you least expect it. How many remember December, the last week of December of 1999? Many thought it was the end of what? Of the world. And many, and there were many uh, people getting ready and thought it was the end of the world. And I almost felt for that until, until a friend of mine told me, no, because everyone's expecting it. And Jesus says, when you do not expect it, that's when I'm going to come. So, 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 we need to be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You do not expect. Now, Jesus tells here for us to be ready. He is not saying to get ready, but yet to be ready. So then how can we be ready for an event that we don't know when it's going to happen? Now, I was married on August 31st, 2003. I knew the date. I knew the, the time I had to be there. I knew my role, my place, everything. So I, it was easy for me to be ready. I knew where I had to be, I knew what church, I knew everything, all the details about my wedding. So for me to be ready was a piece of cake. It was easy. But then how can we be ready for an event that we don't know when it's going to happen? And yet Jesus is saying, be ready. Be ready. And he gives the parable of the ten virgins. And that's what we're going to look at today. So join me in Matthew 25 verse 1. Matthew 25, verse 1. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish, those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom was delayed, don't miss that part. He was delayed. They all slumbered and slept. How many of them slept? All. all of them. And remembering that Paul is telling us it's time to wake up because everyone is asleep. I'm glad it says all because if it would have said nine are asleep but one's awake, we would have thought, well, I'm the one who's not asleep. But here, here Jesus is saying all slumbered and they all slept. Verse 6, And at the midnight cry, and at midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our, our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No. Least there should be not enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they were, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were, what did the Bible say? Ready. ready. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And then we read the saddest words in Scripture. And the door was shut. Why are those the, the saddest words? Because those who were out getting ready, it was too late. The door, when the Bible says the door was shut, that means that salvation, no one can go into, in with the bridegroom anymore. That was it. Just as Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, and if we do a little thinking back of how it was in the days of Noah, Noah had 120 years to get ready and to get others ready. And he got ready. But then there had to come a time where Noah was ready. When he came into the ark and his family came in with him, who shut the door? Not Noah. An angel. God shut the door. And God opened the door. So God closed the door. When God closed the door in the ark, could those outside get in? That's why these are the sad words when it says, and the door was shut. That's it. Grace is closed. Now our message doesn't cover that. It will in a future message. 
But here we see that the door was shut. And meanwhile, those virgins are thinking, oh, we gotta, we gotta hurry up because we gotta go back in. And then verse 11 says, Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, and Jesus again repeats, For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now I stand before you today, friends, a Seventh-day Adventist. That is to say, I believe in the Seventh-day Sabbath, and I am an Adventist because I am waiting for Christ's second coming. Amen. Is there anybody else here who is waiting for Christ's second coming? Yes. Amen. Amen. Christ is coming soon. Christ is coming soon. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. He is coming soon. This is something that, 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 that as Seventh-day Adventists, is in our name. We are waiting for Jesus to return. We are like these ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom. Waiting for him. Waiting. <clears throat> and as these ten virgins represent those who are waiting for Christ, I would like to, uh, I would like to mention that these virgins represent us, God's church. You may say, well, we're the wise versions, and the foolish versions are those who other, other denominations or other religions, those are the foolish. No, no, no. Because these all were versions. That is to say, they all were pure. They all held to Christ's pure religion, pure teachings. If you have been coming to Wednesday prayer meetings and we're studying the book of Revelation, we're going to get to chapter 17 where there's a harlot, that means not a virgin, and she, and she prostitutes herself with other gods and other ideas and, and other religions. But these ten are pure. They're pure. They believe in, in God's true message. That's what I believe these ten virgins represent us. Christ's Optic Lessons, in page 410, says this, In the parable, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time there was no difference between them. So with, so with the church that lives before Christ's second coming. Who is a church that lives before Christ's second coming, waiting for a second coming? It's us. It's Seventh-day Adventists. So it is, she says. All have a knowledge of Scripture, and we do. All have heard the message of Christ near approach, we have, and confidently expect His appearance, we are. But, as in the parable, so it is now. Now that struck me. So, it, so as it is in the parable, she says, that's how it is now. So then how was it in the parable? Five. Jesus calls for fools. We're foolish. Not ready. And five were ready. That is to say today, half of the church is ready. And half of the church isn't ready. A time of waiting intervenes. Faith is tried and when the cry is heard, behold, the bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. Many are unready. End of quote. All of us are waiting. All of us are waiting. But yet she says, for a time there is no difference between them. And that's exactly how the parable is. In the parable, you don't know. You know, they, they all look the same. When do you tell the difference? When the bridegroom comes and they, uh oh, now it's time to, get, to go inside. Then they realize, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready to go in. And what I would like to point out is that both groups are waiting for Christ. Half of them are ready, and the other half think they're ready, but they're not. She says, but as in the parable, so it is now. 
So these wise, wise virgins, they're trimming their lamps and getting ready. And when the foolish ones come and say, give us some of your oil, what did the wise say in verse 9? But the wise answer and say, no, lest, lest there should not be enough for us. You go rather to those who sell. Basically, they're saying, no, we're ready. You go get ready. That's what they're saying. We're ready. You go get ready. You go and get ready. Now, Jesus describes those who were not ready as foolish. And those who were ready as wise. A foolish person in Scripture is one who does not believe God's Word. Because Matthew 7, 26, Jesus himself says, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. If you don't live, if, if you do not um, hear these words and do them, Jesus says, and do them, you're like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So a foolish man doesn't take scripture too, too serious. He may hear it, but doesn't do it. Also, in, in Luke 24, 25, all foolish ones and slow to, to and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. And he's walking to Emmaus and he met with two disciples. And they're sad. And Jesus said, What are you sad? He knew it. He wanted to, he wanted to make a point that the Messiah had to be crucified. And, and Jesus points to them. Oh, foolish ones, he calls them. He calls them foolish. And slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And they, had, they, 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 had, they, they had forgotten to go back and believe what Isaiah says about the Messiah. About what Daniel says about the Messiah. So these five foolish virgins had lamps. But they had no oil. Now we know that the lamp represents scripture. The Bible tells us that his word is a lamp to our feet. But without the Holy Spirit, without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of no good. Without God's Spirit, his word, there are many people who know a lot about scripture. They can tell you dates. And they can tell you scripture by memory, but the Holy Spirit is not in them. And they doubt, they doubt the validity of scripture. So, so without the Holy Spirit, which was what they were lacking, the knowledge of His Word is of no good. Again, Christ Operative Lessons, page 411. And this is the last chapter in, um, in, in Christ Operative Lessons. Which is, which is called um, Meeting the Bridegroom, I think, or Ready to Meet the Bridegroom. It's the last chapter. She says, The class represented by the foolish versions are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. They have not yielded themselves, but, I'm sorry, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They, they have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their own, their old nature to be broken up. And this is why, this is why, what makes the difference is that some, half, were ready. Now during the delay, I invite you to turn to, to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy verses, I mean chapter, th chapter 3. Verse 1 through 5. These five foolish virgins display a form of godliness, but they lack the power. They, they lack the Holy Spirit. And that's what, what Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last day, again, that's now, perilous time will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, both proud, blasphemer, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, 
unforgiving, slander, without self-control, brutal, despising of good, traitors, and it keeps on describing all these characteristics. And then, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. So they have a form of godliness, like these five versions, they had a form of godliness. They had the lamps, they were ready, they were among those who were ready, they had a form of it, but they lacked something. Second Timothy said that they lacked the power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything that, everything that God does is through the Holy Spirit. When a person is transformed, it's because the Holy Spirit did it. Not because the person is just a, a super man or a super woman. The Holy Spirit is, who, is the one who, who changes, transforms the mind. Amen. Which transforms the actions. There is a time to get ready and a time to be ready. And to mix the two can be fatal. Because here we see that those who thought they were ready, sadly, they were lost eternally. So to mix the two can be fatal. The foolish virgins were lost because they were busy getting ready when they should have been ready. Now I am about to turn to Luke, Luke chapter 22, and here I just want to point out one thing, that there is a false readiness. Those, those, you know, we can think we're ready. Here we're going to look at the example of Peter. Peter thought he was ready. Luke 22, verse 31 to 33, Jesus is, Jesus is, um, he's predicting Peter's denial. And he's even telling Peter before it even happens. Imagine that. It's one thing, right, to mess up. But yet, somebody to tell you, you know what, you're going to mess up. And you still deny them. Here Jesus is pleading with Peter and says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. A little parenthesis, don't miss that, friends. Whenever Satan, not whenever, all the time Satan is, and every time Satan is attacking you, Jesus is praying also for you Amen. and interceding for you. Amen. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. <coughs> Verse 33, but he said to him, Lord, what did he say? I am ready. He even says, to go with you both to prison and to what? <coughs> to death. He was ready, but to deny him was cursing and running. Peter depended, Peter had a false readiness. He depended, well, I'm one of Jesus' disciples. That makes me automatically ready. He has chosen me. I do everything that he says. I'm ready. I do what I'm supposed to do, and that qualifies me to be ready. That's, we need to be careful with that. If we think that we just do the things, and by doing something, we're ready. Here we can see that Peter was not ready. We may think, well, I come to church on the Sabbath, so that qualifies me to be ready. No, friends, I'm sorry. Yes, we should come to church on the Sabbath, because God commands us to go. God commands us, and we should do it. But just coming into a building, is not going to make us ready. Amen. Peter thought he was ready by doing all the right things, and we need to be careful that by doing the right things, we think we're ready. By this, I'm not saying, well, let's start doing the wrong things. No. We should always do the right things, because Christians do show good works. Amen. So then, how then can we be ready? Well, the same parable tells us, Matthew 25. Matthew 25, the same parable gives us the clue on how we can be ready. Matthew 25, verse 12. The Bible says, 
Afterwards, the other virgin came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he is answering unto them, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. So because they didn't know him, they couldn't go in. So that means the five virgins who were ready, they obviously what? Knew him. In order to be ready, here Jesus is giving us a clue. You have to, I have to know who you are. Now he knows who everybody is. Because Jeremiah says that even before you were born, he knows you. But this is a different know. A personal relationship. A personal communication. John 13 verse 3 says, And this is eternal life. Here it is. John is telling you, you want eternal life? You want to go in with the bridegroom? You want to be the five wise? This is it. John 17 verse 3. This is eternal life. Ready? Drum roll. That they may know you. That's it right there. That they may what? Know you. What's eternal life? That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is a clue. That's the answer. How can we be ready? Do you know Jesus and does Jesus know you? There was a time where, where some people um, tried to cast out demons in the New Testament and tried to do it just by saying, just, just by using the name of Jesus. They thought they could cast out demons, but the demons, if you remember the story, um, stripped them naked and beat them up. And the demons say, we know who Jesus is. We know who Paul is. But who are you? They, they didn't know. They couldn't see God in them. Why could the demons say, we know who Paul is? Because Paul knew God. He knew him. In Philippians chapter 30, verse 8 through 10, here Paul is, is, is saying that he would give up everything just to know him. Philippians chapter 3 verse 8 to 10 says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. Does anyone have the King James Bible? Does it say something else besides rubbish? Dumb. Dumb. Do we know what dumb is? Now when I heard that word, I wasn't sure share dumb. But I know those who, who grew up in the country, maybe in a farm, know what dung is. And here, you know, the new King James wanted to give it a soft touch. I counted it, I counted it as rubbish. But really what Paul is saying, all those things that I have done before and I have learned, I count it as manure. I count it as lost. Why does he count it as lost? He says, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but which is from the law, but that which is from, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And here he says, that I may know him and the power of the resurrection. Everything that I have accomplished, Paul says, I will give it all up. It's trash. It's done for me. That I may know who God is and the power of his resurrection. Jeremiah 9.23 says, Let the wise man not glory in his wisdom, or let the mighty man not glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glory, glories in this, that he understands and knows me. That's the main point. That he understands, that means you know about, and know me, that means you know him. So there's, it's good to know about God. We need to know about Him, absolutely. Study the Bible, learn the doctrine, that's learning about Him. But, to also know Him. Know Him. Not just know about Him, but know Him. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge. Know who He is. And Jeremiah wished for God's people to have known Him. Because he says in Jeremiah 4.22, 
For my people are foolish. They have not known me. If you do not know God, if we do not know God, we're fools. We're fools. And we're fools thinking that we're going to go into the wedding just knowing about Him, but not knowing who He is. And Matthew, Matthew 7, we're familiar with that, with that verse that says, Many will come in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy, didn't we do miracles, didn't we heal? And what does Jesus say? I don't know you. I don't know you. How can we be ready? Do we know the Lord? Do we know Him? There's a difference between knowing God and knowing about Him. And as I mentioned earlier, I was, I was, I was going to say born, no, I was married. On, on August 31st, 2003, our marriage was born that day. And I would like to, 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 to just conclude with this, with this illustri illustration. Suppose that you want to know about my wife. Know about my wife. Okay? So I take out my computer and I begin to type information about her. How tall she is, how much she weighs, um, her parents' name, her grandparents' name, her favorite color, her favorite meal, um, her favorite places to go. What else information can we know about a person? Um, the color of her eyes, her height, her favorite um, places to go, I already said that. Um, what she likes to do, how she plays the piano, how she learned how to play, all this information. I begin to just type it out and pour out a big research paper. Finally, at the end of the research paper, I'm done. All the information about who? About my wife. And I burn it on a CD. So if anybody says, oh, tell me a little bit about Celine. Oh, just a minute. Here you go. <laughs> Anything you want to know, you'll find it right here. Oh, okay. So, how silly is this? Here is all the information about my wife. So, I want to spend time with my wife. So, I take, I take my wife out to dinner. And we go to a restaurant. And, uh, and, and lately, we've, we've, uh, we have gone into the habit of, of looking for Mediterranean food, and, and so, so I take her to, to a great place, and I take the CD with me. Okay, I appear there, and, and they say, how many? <laughs> so they look at me funny, and, so then I go, I put the chair back, I put the CD, and I sit on the other chair, and what would you like to have? It's, we think it's silly, right? For not saying dumb. Why? Why? Because this CD is not my wife. Or is it? I can kiss it, bro. But it's not going to kiss me back. This is my wife right here. It's flesh, it's bones. If I hit her, she feels pain. If I love her, she feels love. This is my wife right here. Amen? Not the CD. Thank you. The same it is with the Lord. God wants us to have that connection. To know, does God hurt? Does He? Yes. Does He feel joy? Does He feel pain? That is knowing God. We can know all about Him. And have it on written, on a CD, the Bible, on our phones, the scriptures, on our MP3. We can know all about it. But what God wants is to know us intimately. To know us intimately. Yeah. How do we know Him intimately? Well, we know we first learn about Him, yes. But then, through prayer, through prayer, we know about Him. We know more of Him. And through Scripture, when you read the Scripture, don't just read the Scripture just to know about it, but look for the look for Christ's character in the Scripture. When you read Romans chapter one, what does that tell you about God's character? When you read Matthew chapter 5, what does that tell you about Jesus? It tells you something. And, and, and as, as you learn about Him and learn of Him, now when you pray what you've learned of Him, you can incorporate it in prayer. And you can incorporate it and pray, Lord, 
you have done this and you have shown me that you care about this or that you don't like this and you begin to have slowly that communication that communication Paul was about to die and he knew this is going to be our last scripture turn with me to 2 Timothy Paul was about to die he knew he was going to Rome and he was going to Rome for good 2 Timothy 2 verse 6 and he writes to Timothy and, and I'm going to quote here from the King James he says, For I am now, what does the Bible say? Ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul said, I am now ready. He knew his time was coming. And if we jump to chapter 1, verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12, this is why Paul can say, I am now ready. Chapter 1, verse 12 says, For this reason I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I know. And incidentally, those are the same words that were recorded before Ellen White died. Before she died, she was heard saying, I know in whom I have believed. In whom I have Friends, do you know in whom you believe? Amen. Do you know in whom you are waiting to come? We are waiting for Jesus to return. Do you know Him? But more important, does He know who you are? Does He know who you are? Amen. I like to just open the doors of the church and make an appeal that if there is anyone who is not a member of our church, but would like to know through the study of Scripture. There should be a little form, a little form on the pew. And if you could fill it out and just give me your name and contact, and at the end, just leave it in my hand, I will get in contact. If you want to know more about Him, you don't know who he is. You want to know because you want to be ready. You want to be the. You want to be in the wise group. Who, when Jesus comes, you're ready. I am not saying, don't misunderstand me, that ready means perfection. No, we we stay in a readiness in a in a in a. We stay in a mindset of readiness, but improving and growing every day. Amen. Never reaching perfection, absolutely not. Perfection is a step, is a process of a lifetime. But we can know more about Him. If there is somebody here who is not a member of our church and would like to get to know Him through the study of Scripture, Study of scripture, not study of my words, my teachings. I have nothing to offer you, but the Lord does. Amen. The study of His word, fill that part out and give it to me in my hand as, as you leave today. Then I will get in contact with you and meet with you and study the Bible so that then together we can be ready. Amen. For the rest of us, if, you, if it is your desire then to be ready, I invite you to stand.